So my presentation is on the border politics between uh, the US and, and Canada. Uh, and I'm interested in exploring the issues of access to international protection. And I will start with the, uh, this excerpt from the uh, Global Compact on Migration. Uh, one of its objectives, uh, Objective 11, uh, says um, that um, the, the aim of the compact is to ensure security for states, communities and migrants, and facilitate safe and regular cross-border movements uh, while preventing irregular migration. In um, realizing this commitment, states also are called upon to enhance border management cooperation and to ensure uh, that the human rights of migrants uh, are protected. So my aim in this presentation is to um, use some recent uh, Canadian developments uh, to discuss how these two objectives of the Global uh, Compact on Migration, um, promoting international cooperation while at the same time protecting uh, the human rights of migrants, are difficult to reconcile in the case of uh, secondary uh, migratory movement. Um, uh, when I refer to secondary migratory or asylum movements, um, I mean asylum seekers who uh, move onwards uh, from the first country of asylum uh, to another. And it's been a huge issue of debate over the past decades, these um, secondary asylum movements. Um, and I'm interested in my presentation in understanding um, how Canada's refugee system has been instrumentalized, has been used as a tool to stem the secondary movements of asylum seekers um, coming through the, um, the US and Canada border, uh, and, and also to manage uh, the uh, Canada US uh, border. Um, so here are some pictures of our uh, border with the US. It is known as the longest international border between two countries um, in the world. And since the election of uh, Donald Trump, um, as you may know, um, there has been a non-precedented increase in um, the secondary asylum movements across the border. Um, and until March um, um, 2020, uh, when the borders uh, were closed because of uh, the pandemic, there were more than 60,000 migrants crossed the border irregularly, the land border between the US and Canada, to claim asylum in, um, in Canada. So 60,000, um, it's, it's a very high number for us <laughs> because uh, Canada is um, geographically um, isolated and we receive um, some 10,000 um, asylum applications per year in the normal year, um, 60,000 within three years, uh, that was really a lot. And, and these asylum seekers came um, through um, mainly the, the Roxham Road, which is, uh, between, uh, which is in Quebec, and many of them made then their way to, uh, to Ontario, to, to Toronto. So they found themselves um, um, in, in, in Montreal and, and, uh, and mostly in uh, Toronto. Two factors may explain um, these um, upsurge in irregular border crossings. Of course, one of them is uh, the, um, the new US administration, which is not new anymore, but uh, the, uh, the anti-immigrant rhetoric uh, from uh, the Trump administration played um, an important role, um, according to research, um, and also um, the um, hostile asylum policies in the U.S. Uh, was uh, a factor for this um, upsurge. Those who were able to cross the border illegally um, from the U.S. Uh, were able to uh, make their asylum claim, and they were pretty much, you know, welcomed by, um, as you can see on, on the, this photo, for example, uh, officers officers from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Then they were referred to um, the IRB, Immigration Refugee Board, and Social Services. Um, but at the same time, uh, we've seen the uh, the federal government. Um, adopting a very harsh um, discourse, a very harsh narrative against um, um, these asylum seekers. 
um, we've seen really a criminalization of these irregular border crossings. Um, and, and, and there were some policies that were adopted. I think they are um, interesting in terms of showing this uh, criminalization. In, in seven, uh, 2017, an ad hoc intergovernmental task force on irregular migration was created to deal with the situation because there was a sense of crisis at the border. Um, in, in the opinion of the government, federal government, uh, which was under the pressure of uh, the provincial governments in Ontario and, and Quebec. Um, a new Ministry of Border Security and Organized Crime Reduction um, was um, um, established uh, under the portfolio of Public Safety Ministry. And uh, the new minister is uh, Bill Blair that you uh, can see here. Uh, he was uh, previously the uh, chief of police of, of Toronto, very harsh on crime, etc. And now, actually, currently, he is the, uh, the public safety minister uh, at the federal level. Uh, I put this picture, this is our um, uh, previous um, minister of immigration and refugee protection, Ahmed Hussein. Um, he was... He, he was the minister at that time. Um, he's himself a former refugee. He came to Canada from Somalia as a, um, an unaccompanied minor. Um, so he was uh, very instrumental in, in the adoption of these repressive um, policies and institutions as a uh, response to the arrival of irregular um, crossing the border asylum seekers and of course there was also a huge investment in border security for uh, five years um, at the same time uh, there were a lot of um, uh, public opinion poll, polls um, and as you can see on the screen um, put some excerpts um, um, the public uh, opinion um, has been also not very favorable uh, to those who uh, were crossing the border and then uh, claiming refugee status um, in Canada. One poll from 2018 um, found that uh, more than half of um, those who participated in the poll found that Canada is too generous towards asylum seekers who cross into Canada irregularly. One year later, an Ipsos poll found that, uh, again, uh, almost 50% of respondents uh, found that mo most migrants aren't actually refugees, but rather economic migrants. And they were also in favor uh, of uh, the government sending them back to the US. Um, so this, this was a snowball and um, domino effect of um, criminalization of migration and creation of new institutions at the federal level and um, uh, this trend, a negative trend in the public opinion. Um, so this was the um, um, background against which uh, this uh, new um, act has been adopted that changes Canada's uh, refugee protection system. Um, and uh, this omnibus bill, uh, Budget Implementation Act, uh, adopted in June 2019, and this was just before the, uh, the federal elections. Um, it's a 300-page um, huge um, document, and there were some really um, repressive policies uh, when it comes to refugees uh, buried into uh, this omnibus bill, bill, and it was adopted without meaningful debate in the parliament and was really denounced by the opposition parties, um, especially the New Democratic Party. Um, what this uh, act makes is that um, it makes a refugee claimant ineligible um, to uh, claim refugee status in Canada if uh, this person has previously requested a refugee claim in a country with which Canada has an information sharing agreement and arrangement. Now, Canada has uh, um, information sharing agreements and arrangements uh, with the so-called uh, Five Eyes countries partners. These are Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. 
Five Eyes Countries is a um, um, intelligence gathering and sharing um, cooperation uh, agreement founded during the Cold War between these uh, five like-minded countries. It has um, increasingly covered immigration control related issues. So what these uh, acts does um, by making ineligible, ineligible people who have, with a previous asylum claim in one of these four partner countries is that it putting forward the information sharing agreement uh, to exclude asylum claimants uh, from refugee protection in Canada. And what's also interesting is that Border. Um, there's been quite a bit of um, evidence um, and some research published on, on this topic. And um, we've also looked at the uh, parliamentary debates uh, prior to the, the adoption of, um, of, of this new act uh, that clearly shows that uh, the, the aim of the government was to discourage uh, irregular migration and also lessen the caseload uh, at the IRB, a very utilitarian perspective. Um, a research conducted by Smith um, and published last year also showed that uh, the officials in Canada considered the, uh, the new act um, as an attempt to uh, close the list CSA third country loophole so that people will not be able to come across the border anymore. Uh, and officials were uh, really scared that in case of the US policies might spur um, more migration in the lead up uh, to the uh, US presidential election, which is happening now, but the borders are closed. <laughs> but this was the, um, uh, the fear of uh, the, uh, the Canadian officials and it may explain why this act um, was adopted. Um, I would like to um, briefly examine the, um, um, the premises of this new refugee ineligibility ground, which makes um, individuals with a prior um, application an asylum application in one of the uh, five vice partners of Canada um, ineligible from uh, refugee protection in, in terms of refugee uh, protection in Canada. So one of the promises was uh, the countries Canada has information sharing agreements with are safe for asylum seekers. So it's based on the rationale of a safe uh, third country. Um, now, we, um, we know that uh, there is ample evidence that this assumption is not true for some groups of asylum seekers. Uh, Dublin system in Europe uh, illustrates uh, the dangers of uh, these blanket presumption of safety. Um, the UK, the Australian government have been overtly um, fostering hostile environment against asylum seekers. And I've seen the, uh, the recent UK government uh, plan to send asylum seekers uh, to holding centers in <laughs> remote places, including Papua New Guinea um, or Moldova. Um, so this is a recent illustration how um, normally safe countries um, or in theory safe countries for asylum seekers um, may not be that safe um, for some groups of uh, asylum seekers um, and so refugee um, uh, protection is a case-by-case -case, um, um, analysis as well um, similarly uh, the US can hardly be considered as safe uh, we had in July this year a judgment by uh, the federal court that confirmed uh, that the U.S. cannot be considered as a safe country for asylum seekers. Uh, so it's an interesting judgment by the federal court uh, that focuses on the detention of asylum seekers in, in, uh, in the U.S. The court says that uh, uh, asylum seekers are put systematically in detention in horrible conditions. Um, and um, so um, here is an excerpt from the court's judgment uh, they say that, uh, that, that those returned to the U.S. by the Canadian officials are detained as a penalty and without regard to their circumstances, moral 
blameworthiness of their actions. The federal court concluded that detention and ensuing hardship and risks, including denial of access to fair refugee process, infringe upon asylum seekers' right to liberty and security, uh, which is protected in, in the Canadian Chart, uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So federal court very recently in July said that the U.S. is not a safe country for asylum seekers and Canadian authorities should not send asylum seekers back to the U.S. Um, um, and if they do so, um, the responsibility of Canada is engaged in uh, the ill treatment involved um, uh, by returning asylum seekers to the US. Um, the government of Canada unfortunately appealed uh, the federal court decision. I uh, said, oh, we don't agree with it. They appealed it before the federal court of appeal. So we'll see what uh, will happen, but the federal court judgment is very clear about the um, lack of safety for asylum seekers in the US. So this is the first premise of the new act. Uh, the second premise is, um, this is not surprising, uh, those who made a prior refugee claim do not seek international protection, but rather improved um, economic conditions. Um, this is an argument uh, which was already questioned and debunked, a myth that was debunked by evidence-based research um, on secondary asylum movements. Um, according to uh, the um, um, Immigration and Refugee Board statistics in Canada, nearly 50% of refugee claimants uh, who irregularly cross the border to make asylum claim in, in, in Canada uh, were granted refugee status. 50%. So acceptance rate is pretty um, pretty high. It, again, we don't know uh, how many of them had a prior uh, refugee claim in the US, uh, but still 50% um, points to the fact that these individuals do have um, a well-founded um, fear um, and, and they should be able to, to make their uh, refugee claim in Canada. So there are genuine protection needs for this population. Um, and on the excerpt, um, you can see um, a principle um, by the United, uh, UNHCR in uh, 1991. Uh, the UNHCR said that um, asylum should not be refused solely on the grounds that it could have been sold elsewhere. United Nations uh, uh, researchers um, have um, repeated over and over again this principle um, and the third um, assumption um, uh, behind the, uh, the new act is this one, ineligible claims, claimants still have access to an effective remedy in Canada. Um, so th this was um, um, very much um, present in the discourse of the government. They said, okay, this is barring uh, refugee claimants, um, uh, from accessing the Immigration and Refugee Board, uh, but their cases uh, will be triaged to what is called a pre-removal risk assessment. So the government said they will still have access to an effective remedy. It is not the Immigration and Refugee Board, uh, but they uh, will uh, be uh, having a hearing uh, in terms of pre-removal risk assessment. Uh, now, again, this claim is very much questionable, and I've prepared this, uh, this chart for you, uh, just um, to illustrate the fundamental differences between the two remedies. So normally, asylum seekers in Canada uh, do have access to uh, the refugee protection uh, division of the Immigration and Refugee Board, which is a quasi-judicial uh, process. Um, IRB is an administrative tribunal in Canada uh, that examines um, the uh, refugee claims, uh, whereas pre-removal risk assessment is complement, com completely different. It's an administrative remedy of last resort for those who are an, under, under a deportation order. So it's, it's, it's completely different uh, sets of um, um, uh, remedies and, um, and rules that apply and also the rights that come uh, with these uh, two different uh, kinds of remedies. Um, 
So IRB, Refugee Protection Division, assesses the refugee claim, uh, whereas the, within the PRA, what we call PRA, Pre-Removal Risk Assessment, uh, it is about the assessment of uh, the risk of removal from Canada um, in accordance with the non refoulement principles. Um, the Refugee Protection Division is formed of independent adjudicators and they are experts in refugee law. They uh, have received continuing training um, and, and whereas uh, the pre-removal risk assessment is made by the civil servants in the Immigration um, and Refugee Ministry. Um, they do have the right to appeal uh, when it comes to um, a process before the um, Refugee and Protection Division, uh, whereas there is uh, no right to appeal uh, within the pre-removal risk assessment. There is a judicial review process, uh, which is hardly uh, an um, effective remedy. And again, uh, the acceptance rate um, is approximately 50% under the normal uh, refugee uh, protection division uh, process, whereas the pre-removal risk assessment um, acceptance rate um, has been continu continually um, very low. It was 9% in 2019. So there are fundamental differences between these two um, remedies available uh, to, um, to uh, asylum claimants and um, within the new act uh, making ineligible people with a prior claim in one of the uh, five eyes uh, partners of Canada uh, while Canada is denying uh, an effective remedy uh, and denying access to international protection to these individuals. Um, to conclude um, I would say that um, Canada's recent policies um, illustrate um, how border management cooperation, which is mentioned in uh, the Global Compact on Migration, um, is used uh, to deny access to international protection. This is a recent illustration. Um, and, um, and it's interesting because Canada uh, is governed currently by a liberal government. Um, they are more open to refugees. Um, they are championing at the global level uh, these two global compacts on migration on, on refugees. And at the same time, they go on and, and, and take measures that close the border and uh, the refugee protection system to certain groups of uh, asylum seekers. Um, I think this also illustrates how border politics uh, creeps into the refugee process. Um, they change the asylum architecture, they impact the uh, political narratives, uh, they impact also on uh, the public perceptions. So I think that there are lots of lessons um, uh, that I can use for um, um, my research within uh, the uh, broader protect research project when I look at the uh, these recent uh, policies and, and Canada's efforts to close the safe third country agreement loophole. Of course from the government's perspective um, there are lots of advantages um, in terms of using information sharing agreements. Um, it is more advantages to use them than to revise the safe third country agreement uh, for various reasons because um, currently the government is dealing with a very um, challenging um, the US administration um, and there are other reasons as well um, but, but most mostly the, you know, the information sharing agreements using it in, a, um, in a, um, a policy that denies access to international protection offers uh, flexibility and discretion to the government because um, there is no review by the parliament uh, when they refer to information sharing agreements uh, and there is no independent monitoring mechanism or other accountability mechanisms uh, when the government uh, deny access by reference to information sharing agreements. Uh, whereas if they want to, um, to uh, revise the uh, safe third country agreement, well, they have to, um, to, to be more accountable before the parliament, um, in addition to um, engage in these discussions with the US. But I think there is more accountability um, and um, more rooms for, um, for the protection of um, for asylum seekers if they want to um, revise the SCCA, whereas the um, information sharing agreement gave them really this um, unlimited discretion. 
and to um, add more countries and, and deny uh, asylum seekers with a prior uh, claim in these countries, one of these countries. Um, I think the, uh, the Global Compact uh, on Migration and on Refugees um, also avoid addressing uh, the uh, secondary asylum movements. And it's, um, I think it's problematic because their silence is not um, something uh, neutral. I think it is meaningful. And I think this silence in these two global compacts when it comes to addressing the uh, um, secondary movements, asylum movements, um, and, um, and reiterating the state responsibility um, exacerbates the hardship faced by asylum seekers in accessing international protection. I thank you.